one of my favorite things to talk about. It's one of the my, one of the reasons why BSM is top tier in my mind and in my heart is because of missions. Okay, um, and specifically the mission of God, therefore being God's people's mission, um, is what we've been talking about. And so um, I really want to be good stewards of your time, and it's a big topic, and so I'm just gonna dive right in if that's okay with you guys. Um, but we started off last week talking about what's the mission. Okay, so as we've sung about and as we will continue to talk about, we serve Jesus here. Um, we call Jesus Lord, Jesus King of our lives. He's who we sing about worship, and we um, know that we are saved by him and therefore have a relationship with God because of him. And so um, everything that we teach here and follow here is what Jesus taught. And so one of the things that we look at for our mission and our purpose as the people of God is what um, Jesus commanded us and left us with. And so his last words before he ascended to heaven, so long story short, Jesus came here from heaven, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, resurrected from the grave three days later, and then he continued to teach, um, leaving us with this one final lesson in Acts 1.8. Okay, so Acts 1-8 is, this, is the verse for this entire series. So this week, last week, and next week. And so it says, Jesus speaking, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Um, and, and the different gospels say this a little bit differently, but Jesus is essentially saying, um, I'm going to give you what you need, and I'm going to stick with you. I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit so that you know, because I have authority um, is what Matthew 28 says um, in, this same, in this same situation. But he says, you will be my witnesses, so you will tell what you've seen me do in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so what we clarified last week, and I'll remind you guys if you've forgotten or if you weren't here, um, we clarified that for the disciples at this time, the followers of Jesus, Jesus was probably very literal. He was probably saying, you need to go to Jerusalem and start there. Tell everybody what you've seen me do and what you've heard me say. Tell everybody in Jerusalem. Then go to Judea, then go to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. But for us, modern day United States, Jesus followers, it probably doesn't mean that the first place that you go to witness is Jerusalem. Am I right? That's a pretty expensive flight, and chances are you don't know zip about the culture in Jerusalem right now. So it'd be kind of awkward. So what we talked about last week is how, how does this command still apply to us? And we talked about maybe it means that our mission starts at home. We talked about last week's big idea was that our mission starts at home. And we talked about how Jesus, he, he called Matthew into this grand mission. He said, follow me. And the first place he took Matthew was straight back home. You're right? We were like, oh, that's kind of lame. We thought you were going to go on an adventure. But he took him straight back home, and they threw a party for all of his tax collector friends and his family. And so we talked about how that can be easy and hard to take Jesus to our families and to our friends and to our coworkers. But tonight, we're going to look at a little bit of what it means to take the gospel to Samaria. Okay? So Samaria, um, we're going to... We're going to talk about one instance where Jesus goes to Samaria. Because one thing that we learn as we read about Jesus is if Jesus is going to command us to do something, he probably set an example for us to follow. He's good like that. He knows we're kind of slow. And so if he's going to command you to do something, he usually left you a really good example. And so tonight's big idea, and we'll talk about how it plays out in the life of Jesus, is that our mission includes those we find difficult to love. So tonight's big idea is our mission includes those we find difficult to love. And so if you've got your Bibles, flip them open or flip them on. If you don't, that's perfectly fine. Everything um, that we're going to read tonight is going to be up on the screens. Also, if you don't have a Bible or you know someone who needs a Bible, we hand those out like candy. They're at the back. You can have one free of charge. But you could also donate $5 to pie my face for the Bible. That'd be fun too. Um, we are going to be in John chapter 4. So John is one of the first books of the New Testament. It's a, it is the story following Jesus' teachings, following everything he did and he said. And so um, that's why the story is going to be about Jesus. And so just to build before we read John chapter 4 about Jesus' interaction, specifically with a Samaritan, I want to talk about how like the people that are difficult to love in our lives, okay? That can mean... Um, people who we actually don't like, like our enemies, they walk in the room, we just want to, you know, we just want to choke them a little bit. We, we explode just 
at all the time. They walk in and all of a sudden you feel yourself twitching. You just don't like them. Whether they actually did something to you or you imagine they did something to you. Um, but we just don't like those people. They're, we don't like them because they're mean or their personality rubs us wrong or they hurt us or someone we love. Um, but there's also people we just don't vibe with. Okay? You can't be everybody's cup of tea. We don't not like them, but we don't like them either. Does that make sense to you guys? There are just people you just don't, you're like, you're fine if you just stay in your lane. Um, for example, just briefly for an example, I went on a date with this guy one time, not the guy I married, um, and he talked the whole time about how his dream was to work out with his wife every day. And the whole time I was like, this is not going anywhere. <laughs> so like, he's, he's nothing wrong with him. We just don't vibe, okay? Um, there's people like that. They're hard to love just because they're different. And there are people who are just flat out different from us. Like they don't speak the way we speak. Their personality, they don't process information the way we process information. We don't know how to approach them. So they're difficult to love just because we don't understand them. And so all three of those kind of have a place in this story we're looking at with Jesus. And so Jesus meets a woman from Samaria. So verse um, three, it says, so he left Judea and he went more, once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So history tells us, um, I'm going to poorly tell it, but history tells us that Israel um, had a pretty bad di divide, had a pretty bad breakup. It's what happens in some of the prophets. If you go back to Old Testament, you read the minor prophets, you read the major prophets, um, there was this huge division. And one of the divisions had Jerusalem, which had the temple in it. But then the other division had Samaria. They made Samaria their new capital. But from this point forward, countries come in, they take the Jews, they take them off to captivity. Um, and in the meantime, the people in this area, they intermarried. They married people of other cultures, of other religions, from other countries, um, which we actually don't know anything about. For one, because we're from America, which is called the melting pot, which means essentially we're all a little mixed. Um, if you didn't know that, that's true about you too. Um, we're all a little mixed. It's one of the beautiful things about being part of the United States. Um, we also don't know what it's like for our race to equate to religion. At this time, like wherever you were born, that's, that's the God you served. And so if you, if you were to betray your country, you were to betray your God. And so these people in Samaria, they were those people. And at this time... The Jews looked at them literally like dogs, and not like the dogs we have that we carry in purses, like the dogs on the streets you won't even throw your food to. They looked at them like the scum of the earth, like these mixed breeds who deserve nothing. They called them unclean, which means that if you were to hang out with them, eat with them, walk through their country, then you were also to be unclean, which means you weren't allowed to worship God in the temple. Just like, worst thing that could happen to you would be to hang out with a Samaritan, okay? So they're the people that the Jews had a hard time loving. In fact, I would say they just didn't love the Samaritans. But Jesus, on multiple occasions, pushes back on this standard. So this is one of them. He says he had to go through Samaria. I think that's important. Um, and Jesus meets this woman and came into a town in Samaria called Sikar, near the plot of the ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. So the fact that it's noon tells us a couple of things. Um, it tells us that it's not when everybody else comes to get water. You know, you're going to trek up the hill to get um, water from the well. It's usually early in the morning. Which means if this woman was coming to the well, we can probably assume that she was an outcast. So if Samaritans are outcast, and then she's the outcast of the outcast, we can see a couple things about her. Um, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living, living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? 
Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So she points out what we're pointing out. She says, don't talk to me. Why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan. Not failing to mention, it was probably awkward for Jesus just to talk to a woman, right? We look, we look Jews talking to Samaritans awkward, man talking to woman's kind of awkward, um, in the middle of the day kind of woman, it's really awkward. And so Jesus, we see Jesus pressing through the awkward and making an attempt to have a conversation with her. And just like Jesus does, he takes an ordinary moment and he invites something beautiful and eternal and spiritual into it. That's what Jesus does. He takes ordinary moments and he makes them extraordinary. And that's what he does here. He says, you know what? Actually, you know, if you knew me, if you knew that I was the son of God, then we'd be having a completely different conversation. I would be giving you something to drink, living water that satisfies. So just for the sake of time, um, the next part goes is this. She starts to, starts to realize that this guy's a holy guy. Not only is he a holy guy, he's a prophet of some sorts. Because Jesus points out things about her that he never should have known. He points out, he says, you know, where's your husband? She was like, well, I don't have one. He's like, I know you don't have one. I know you've had many. And the one you're with right now is not your husband. And so Jesus points out these things that he shouldn't know, clarifying to her that he really is the son of God. He blows her mind, okay? He's building up to this moment. And then they get to a, a real deeper issue. The reason, another reason why she was probably surprised that Jesus, a Jewish man, would come and approach her. She says, well... You don't even, we don't even agree on where to worship. That's, that's the, kind of the argument. It goes from uh, a discussion about her relationships to a discussion about the, the question she has about worship. She says, well, I think we should worship here. He, you think that we should worship there. And Jesus points out something sweet. And he says, there's going to come a day where it doesn't matter. Because you're going to worship in spirit. And he's, a, he's, foreshadowing for when the Messiah comes. But little does she know that the Messiah is in front of her. In verse 25, this is, the, this is one of my favorite parts, it says, the woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. So they have this moment. Jesus crosses cultural and social barriers to meet this woman and it tells us a little bit about what it means to love and to take the mission to people who are difficult to love. And the, one of the main big things that I hope that we take away from this tonight is that it takes going out of your way. Unlike, unlike taking the mission home, taking the mission to people who are more difficult to love takes going out of your way. You're never naturally going to be drawn to people different than you. You know, the phrase says birds of a feather flock together. It means people you're like, you end up being with. You can see that. You can look at the dorms. They start to be like that. The clubs, they start to be like that. The churches, right? You start to look, and you're like, oh, birds of a feather flock together. But it's because you only do what comes natural to you when you function on autopilot. If you just live day to day, you'll never end up around people that are hard to love. You'll avoid those people because it doesn't come natural, because it takes your energy. It's taxing. On another note, um, you, you will have to intentionally, intentionally make a choice to love people who are difficult to love. Maybe those who don't deserve your love or don't deserve your trust or don't deserve your attention, it will not come naturally. It will not fit perfectly into your schedule to take the mission to people who aren't like you. But yet, the mission that Jesus leaves us with includes Samaria. It includes Samaria. And even when Jesus was going to this well, Samaria was straight right where he needed to go, but his disciples wanted to avoid it. Because the natural thing to do is to avoid people who aren't like you, who are difficult to love. But we see this moment where Jesus makes a point to include this in his mission, 
to his disciples at the time, the Samaritans were the last people they could relate to or they wanted to share Jesus with. But Jesus had to go to Samaria. Of course, it takes seeing things from a different perspective. That's why Jesus goes on to discuss her hangups. He talks about her hangups with um, her, her marriages and with men. He talks about her hangups with worship and with Jew, the Jews. Um, but the news of salvation found in Jesus, if it's going to go to the ends of the earth, like Acts 1 8 says, it'll go a lot faster if we will be witnesses to people who are different than us, who, who have different political ideas, different races, different personality types, different standards of even how to act in public. But the mission to the ends of the earth goes faster when we include the people who are not like us. And here's how I know. Let's take a look at verse 27. Well, this is, this is what happened immediately after. Uh, his disciples returned. They're surprised to find him talking with a woman. No one asked, what do you want? Why are you talking with her? The disciples had learned at this point to shut up. Um, verse 28 says, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out to the town and made their way towards him. As you go, as you read on, the disciples start to talk about lunch. This is what I talked about last week. The disciples start to talk about lunch. They're like, hey, um, Jesus, I don't know if you've looked at the schedule, but it's really actually time to eat now. Um, what is your plan for dinner? What are we going to have for dinner? Do you have a gluten-free option? They go on, and Jesus, as rightfully so, gets frustrated. He looks at them and goes, look up. Jesus says, look up. The harvest is ready. The harvest is ready. And he sees over the hill this beautiful scene in verse 39. It says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. That's just a mini side note that his disciples were missing it because it didn't fit in their schedule and they were hungry. It's just a side, that's a whole nother lesson about how silly we can be and how we can miss something eternal because we're focused on what's temporary right in front of us. But Jesus shows us right here that not only did he come to save the woman at the well, but he came to save the Samaritans. He came to save the city. And we talked about that last week about how the gospel came to you on its way to someone else. I can't help but think that in Genesis, when Jacob was commanded to build that well, that God was dreaming about the day when the Samaritan woman would meet Jesus at the well and that she would take the message and bear his name and be a witness in Samaria. I can't help but imagine that that's what Jesus, Jesus had in store. Because this man really is the savior of the world. And we see the process begin all over again, right? Jesus models how to be on mission, but he hands that mission straight off to the Samaritan woman. And what did we talk about last week? That the, the mission starts at home. And guys, I actually think that her home was probably the people that were hard to love, right? And that's true for some of us too. We 10 out of 10 times rather be with our friends and our family because our family can be difficult to love, but we see her, we see her and read between the lines, know that she was an outcast of society and turned around and went back to the same women that wouldn't walk with her to the well, maybe even the same men that didn't want to be married to her. And she brought them to find Jesus too. Because could you, could you imagine a world where your worst enemy the worst person you can possibly imagine. Think of, think of the person who stabbed you in the back the biggest. Could you imagine a world where they knew Jesus? Could you imagine a world where the people that are hard to love were transformed by Jesus and began to look like Jesus? Because this is proof to Jesus' disciples and to us today that even the scum of the earth can be transformed by Jesus and start to reflect his image and join us in the mission. 
Could you imagine working side by side with the same people that hurt you on mission for Christ, taking the gospel, the good news of salvation to the ends of the earth? Because that's what Jesus proves in this story. Of course, it does not come naturally. If you're waiting for it to feel right in your heart and to have peace in your stomach, if you're waiting for it to be easy to love people who are hard to love, then you're wrong. It doesn't come naturally, but it is worth it. I want to think about Jesus for a second. So I talked about how there's nothing that Jesus could command us to do that he didn't model already for us. But this, this has been modeled all through Jesus' ministry from the beginning. You see, Jesus was on the throne, and he has been and always will be. And Jesus was in heaven where he was adored day in, day out, by heaven and angels and people forever and ever, treated completely perfectly the way he deserved. But Jesus left it all. He went out of his way to come to earth and to love the people who were difficult to love. Guys, that's us. Like, we're the ones that are difficult to love. Romans 5 says, You see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He says, while we were still powerless. He's saying, we are the ungodly. Very rarely would anyone die for a righteous person. Even a good person. Who would die for a good person? Though a good, for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But you see... But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we now have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? You see, Jesus is the one who ultimately is the one who loved his enemies, who sought out the people who were hard to love, who came for the people who were broken and evil and unrighteous, and those people were us. It was me. And Jesus went out of his way. Could you have imagined if God looked at you drowning in your mistakes, drowning in your shame, and he said, well, if I went to save them, it would be a little awkward. Could you imagine if, he, if he was look, Jesus was looking at the cross, the cross that it was going to take to save us, and he said, well, it doesn't really fit in my schedule. Could you imagine if he said, well, I already have enough friends. Gosh, Jesus would never do that. But that's what we do. We look at these, these people who, who maybe it would just take a little bit of learning, a little bit of understanding to relate to them, to get to know them, to love them. But we're like, man, I just don't really have time for that. I just don't really have time to go out of my way and talk to my classmates. I just don't, I think it would be really awkward to bring up Jesus at work. I just think that would be a little awkward. But Jesus went out of his way to die on our behalf, to dramatically display God's love for us by leaving his throne to be tortured and killed. Of course, Praise God, Jesus did defeat death and he did make a way for us to have a restored relationship with God. He gave us a hope, a future, he gave us freedom from sin, but he also died to give us a mission. The gospel is the inspiration for the mission. God's mission is the reason why we are on mission. And as long as there are people in our life and people on our campus, and people on that map that don't know about the good news of what Jesus has done for us, then the mission is still on. Whether it's the right time for you or the wrong time for you, the mission is still on and is still very much a command from God. Last week we talked about how the gospel came to you on its way to someone else. And I want you to, I want you to remember the person who shared the gospel with you because chances are it wasn't on their schedule. And chances are it was a little awkward. And chances are they went out of the way. Even how did you, how'd you end up at the BSM? It's probably because somebody went out of their way to invite you to come to this. Because love doesn't just happen. 
especially for people who are different than us, right? We could spend all day with our family and not love them because we're stuck with them. But there are people in our life that we need to go out of our way to seek. People on the fringe of society, the outcast, the slum. Because Jesus died for them just as much as he died for you. Some of you are here tonight um, because Jesus is seeking you out. That's what that verse in Romans 5 says. Is that It says, not when you had it all together, not when you were perfect or on your best day, but on your worst day, Jesus was thinking of you and thought you were worthy of dying, up, dying for. And so some of you are here tonight and you don't feel like you have a right relationship with God or any relationship with God. And I want to tell you that Jesus has already done everything it takes to have a relationship with you. And all you have to do is to believe and to trust in that. And one of the things that we say every week here at 402 is that we don't want to just talk about God. We want to talk to God. And we don't, we don't believe in a God who lives far, far away on a throne in a temple around smoke and windows. We believe in a God who sent his spirit to be with us, to live with, within us, those of us who know Christ. And because of that, we can talk to God anywhere, anytime because of what Jesus did. And so whether you're here tonight with a relationship with God or without a relationship with God, whether you feel like you've lived on mission or you haven't lived on mission, I promise that there's something God is wanting to say to you and hear from you. And so what I'd like for us to do is to pray. Um, prayer can be, um, we, we can look at it like it's cliche. Um, we can believe like it's talking to the ceiling or just quiet moments, you know, where we just steady our soul. But I believe prayer is the most powerful thing that we can do because you're talking to the most powerful being that there is. And so whatever I say doesn't really matter, but what you say to God matters the most. And so if you guys would bow your heads and close your eyes, I'd like for you to focus, like for you to quiet your soul, quiet thinking about your homework that's due or um, whatever distractions are in your mind. And I want you to pray to God because he can hear you. And he can hear the things that you need and he can hear the questions you long to be answered. He can hear your fears about being on missions and going to the people that are hard to love. And he knows you better than you even know yourself. God, I thank you for sending your son to die for us. I thank you for being close and coming on what seemed like an impossible mission to save us and to get our attention, and I'm thankful that you did. And God, I pray that we would trust in you every day, a little deeper, and that we would be brave and confident to move forward and be your witness at home, and on our campus and at work, to people who are easy to love and to people who are hard to love, people who are like us and people who aren't like us. And God, that we would take the good news of your salvation to the ends of the earth. I pray that Tarleton would be the place that sends out missionaries to the ends of the earth, to every tribe, every tongue, every nation. God, I pray that you would open our eyes to the harvest, that you would protect us from being distracted by the temporary things like the disciples in this story. And I thank you for saving the woman at the well and saving me. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. As the band comes forward, and as we head into one last song of worship, it really, like, like I said, like my prayer is not the most important thing. Your conversation with God is the most important thing. The lyrics to this song, if you can hit the notes or not, is not the most important thing. But taking this moment, to address what you need to address with God is. If you guys would stand and worship. Thank you for watching this video from the Tarleton BSM. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments below or contact us at www.tarletonbsm.com. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Tarleton BSM. <laughs>